Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca, I'm a fish biologist, an ichthyologist and also a PhD student. I specialise and study the evolution of lower card catfishes, which are also known as plecos or whiptail catfishes or L numbers within the aquarium trade. And one of the big questions people ask when they see them within the aquarium or whether they own one is whether their fish is male or female. When it comes to actually sexing lower cards, it can be really difficult and a lot of people do struggle because a lot of them are not the most sexually dimorphic. It's more subtle traits, there's not the big colour traits that you'd see in say guppies or anything like that. So one of the big things I'd say is you want a close to mature fish or mature fish. A lot of people are asking about juveniles. Juveniles can have really ambiguous um, anatomy that makes them really difficult to actually sex and identify whether they're male or female. They tend to look a little bit more feminine I think. But it's never that obvious, they don't have the really strong traits. For some genera, you might want a fish that's around one year, two years, others you might want a three, four, five year old fish. And it's better to go on the older end than the younger end because then you're much more sure. There are a few ideas about whether the fishes are fertile after so many years, but this is likely due to environmental factors and diet rather than them actually becoming infertile due to their uh, general uh, physiology, biology, or sort of life history. But how to actually identify whether your fish is male or female? First, you just yeah, you just want to know that they're mature fish. And a lot of these traits kind of are hints of a mature fish beyond the actual size of fish. Uh, quite often you do get stunting, which can make it a little bit more ambiguous and they don't always seem to mature as they would have uh, normally. So one of the big ones that I'm going to talk about, and most people that might not have as much um, time with law cards or work with them or particularly in a scientific context uh, because a, a lot of aquarists use loads of different um, methods but it even experience lower card enthusiasts some I prefer to look at what's known as the genital papalia, the urogenital pore or the vent so we're actually venting the lower card um, it doesn't need to come out of the water like you would perhaps with a lot of cichlids so so this is kind of, I think, the most reliable method. Not everyone likes it. It's not always the easiest to see. It, you do need to see the abdomen. So you don't have to take the fish out of water. Sometimes it's easier. You do need a mature fish. This is only sort of going to show in a mature fish anyway. But this is also what a lot of scientists use, particularly very ambiguous genera, such as ketostoma, the rubber noses, um, or bulldog plecos they sometimes get caught. Uh, calls not to be confused with Pavarotto Sinclair's Jumbo. Um, I prefer it to, on Barium Cistrus or Hemian Cistrus Panac, that lot, to use the, this because they are so ambiguous. But quite a lot of them, this is where you'll see if they're actually male or female. So the genital papilla or urogenital pore, the vent, is basically about the same, it's sort of shared as the anus of the fish and it does depend, not all law cards have it shared. Um, so that's like Neoplacostoma, Minae, um, or at least Neoplacostomas, they're separate but they're not really found in the trade. So this is kind of the shape of this organ, so it's on the abdomen, it will stick out quite obviously, a lot of people get a little bit confused by it. This is also where you might see calaminous worms if they do have them. So it will be V-shaped and quite elongated males. In females, it will be a U or more of a very wide of square shape. And it does vary. Some species is a lot more triangular. Some species is a lot more um, square. So it's not all like one species applies for all. And it's worth actually comparing. So if you're not sure about one species or genera, then finding others of that same and just comparing them other mature fish because it can be quite difficult. But this I find the most reliable method when it comes to adults. And there's several reasons why. And one of these is actually that mature females will, can, not all, but quite often will develop spotting around this vent, this urogenital pore. And this can be a green colour, it can be a yellow colour. Sometimes they get a little bit of a blush I find. And this is where um, it just seems to be found in, well, to the 
like eye is in that mature fish and this is a sign I use for maturity if you go under a microscope or maybe a macro lens you can actually use it to identify females in immature fish but it's found particularly in hypostomne you won't really see it in lower carne or I've never seen it in lower carne or maybe like hypopotomne I've not really seen it in, and I've never been able to judge it in uh, Vilepine or some of the rarer ones. So it's more of your traditional pleco um, on this spotting, but the actual shape, uh, the differences in the shape is kind of general all the way through the females. And you can even see it in sitcoms where females have a much wider pore than the uh, males. The females obviously have a much larger cell to sort of release, I guess. Um, so it is a lot larger in them and it's kind of the best method by far. If a, a store should be more than happy to let you look at the lower card, so maybe they bring out a bowl or a poly box or something, so you can look at them from all angles. If they're not happy to do that, then usually maybe you either take the risk, but they might not be um, have as much time with lower cards because it's kind of one of the things that if you want to, uh, you really need to look at a lot of features to be 100%, especially if you're spending quite a bit, a bit on the fish. So what other anatomy would you use uh, to sex lower cards? So this would be, the body shape is not the big, I'm not the biggest fan of, but a lot of people do like it. I find because it, there's so much variation in shapes and if you get one that's slightly stunted, it's going to be shorter bodied, its head's going to be a lot sort of, um, deep and then the juveniles look a lot more elongate anyway and you get individual variations some are worse than others for this individual variation so so one of the big ones is head shape a lot of people say I think it's like shorter and wider males um, or elongate in females I don't I don't like I look at all the images and I compare them I'm just not a hundred percent on it's so subtle the differences and another one is weight so a lot of people will look at whether the fish is plumper so a plumper one's more likely to be female this is quite it is true females are more likely to be plumper because they're more likely to be full of eggs the only issue is you've got really well fed male and a less well fed female also females if they're um they've just laid eggs they're going to be much more skinny so it's not the most reliable and some species are generally more plump than others so a panaculus, um, Macaso panaculus can be a lot more, well hypencistrus as well can be a little bit more chubby than some of the more elongate ones and sometimes I use it more of a measure of whether, if I know there's a female and I know it's a female I use it to maybe measure whether she's going to lay eggs or not. And this you can kind of find in all of them because all of them, the females, do produce a number of eggs. The number actually varies, but I think the largest in some of the larger genera, they will produce it in the hundreds, but in the smaller ones, um, much less. Um, like I think, hypocystrous egg has always been recorded as few, but egg number, fecundity in general, always corresponds to how many um, to different environmental factors anyway. So I don't think there's anything, there are a few things like shape in general, some, so Decicera, uh, the pelvic fins are more elongated in the uh, males. I, I, it's not a bad feature actually, that's quite an easy one to see, but there's all sorts of really subtle ones for different genera uh, that make it kind of easier to see. So one of the other ones, so probably the last one you'll see quite often is a donto. So these are the toothy spines that, well, the t spines on the lob lower cars that are made of dentine and similar in structure to teeth, um, or the same in structure, I think. Um, so these are found on all lower cars. If you look, some you just need to look much more up close, so that even in autosynclus and stuff like that. But odontos are most obvious if you're looking at something like, well, even like pseudoncistrus, uh, hypencistrus, it's not anything, it just, it's not connected to the name of the cistrus, like just because they've got incistrus, it doesn't mean they have large odontos. 
Uh, there's some really amazing ones, um, which I cannot remember the name of. Uh, other ones with really large, obviously you've got Panaculus, Pana, uh, Picoltia. They're not really sexually dimorphic, but they're very large in Panac, Varian, Citrus, where they can be large. Um, there's a whole diversity of them. And sometimes they are sexually dimorphic. So in some genera, the males can develop very large odontos that are seasonal, and they do tend to drop, but they also regrow. So the ones where it is actually a diagnostic feature is that Picoltia group. Picoltia group includes Hypencistrus, Panaculus, and um, Picoltia, obviously. It doesn't, add, it does include scope and ancestors, but it's not really a great way of sexing scope and ancestors. They're just some gigantic, uh, similar to Picoltia Savagei, where it's not really a great way to actually sex the difference between the males and the females. But they can be really large in um, those main ones, so the main smaller ones. Um, it will be large at the caudal peduncle, so where the body meets the tail, also on the pectoral fins, and also by that gear percla. So there's sort of three spots to look at it, and that's when you get much more mature fish, and that's where it's much more obvious. Um, they do kind of drop. It's not the most reliable method in general. Others actually where it is maybe more useful would be like Stereosoma, Stereomus tichthys, Valoella, Rhinolocoria and a, quite a lot of those lower carnae where the males develop quite large odontos around the head or in the case of Valoella or twig catfishes along the rostrum. So that is probably the best way to identify males, it's wider the rostrum anyway in Valoella um, but it's the quickest way to identify a mature male and a, um, whether it's a male at all. So the last one that's very specific is tentacles. So tentacles are exclusive to the genus Ancestrus, also known as bristle noses, or uh, other plecos, because you get like um, Medusa pleco, which is Ancestrus ranunculus, Ancestrus macrophthalamus, Agaboensis, and quite a few others. Um, so in Ancestrus and actually Lassie Ancestrus tentaculatus, um, I think that's how it's pronounced, they actually have tentacles that tend to be large in the males and or might only be present in the males. This is not a hard fast rule. So the common bristle nose, that's the easiest one, that is has large tentacles on the males, the females have minimal to none. In others, you might get larger tentacles in the males and slightly smaller ones in the females, like in the Mononcus. In Ancestrus macrophthalamus, it's pretty much the same. It really varies, but the majority of the tentacles will be larger in the males. This is actually because the tentacles are, um, what would it be? Homologous? Homologous in origin to the sheaths, so the little skin that holds the odontodes. And so that kind of makes sense why it is somewhat sexually dimorphic, but not always, because odontos are not always uh, sexually dimorphic. Like my balance, it's just get very large odontos, but that's also in the female. And I've got great photos of balance, it's just dermatoides, where it is actually large in a female. So tentacles, if you're using the converse of nose, it's kind of fine, but others, it's not very reliable. And a lot of people, I guess that comes into the misidentification of ancestrous ranunculus and stuff, where people see a larger ancestrous and they're like, oh, that must be ranunculus, and it's like, no. It's just large bristle nose, they get much bigger, um, bristle, common bristle noses. So, which ones are myths? I've seen quite a few different myths when it comes to actually sexing lower cards. So a big one I've seen is behaviour. This is actually based on a lot of pseudoscience that you'll see throughout uh, zoology in general, that the males are much more aggressive. And I could do a whole video about this because it's not actually true, particularly in lower cards. The males and females are equally as aggressive, but the aggression kind of has different... Um, environment. So the females tend to roam a lot once they're mature. They 
do stick to a cave, but they're not sticking to a cave to spawn. The males stick to a cave to spawn. The females are just as aggressive and territorial. They're just kind of over a wider area. So my female is a lot more of a pain to deal with than the male. The male will test out different caves. She'll roam around the whole tank and she will be, if she's going to be a drama, she'll be a drama like that. Um, Behaviour. You can see plenty of videos of two female bristle noses actually attacking each other, and I've seen it personally. Um, it's, it's the aggression's the same; it's just the cause it is, or sort of the setting is kind of different. Fe males are not more aggressive than females. There's no reason for them to be because they're still they do value those crevices to hide. Males just value it also to spawn. Um, and this also comes into as another idea that males, you can identify a male because he's using caves. Females also retreat to caves. Um, they tend to seem to have a preference cave, but all of them, they kind of can change their preference cave, so it's not really reliable. Unless you're sitting and watching for long, like maybe if it's in your office and you're facing the tank, you might notice a difference in cave use. Uh, there kind of is because we know that uh, males are more easy caught than females, but it doesn't like it's not going to be a reliable way to sex them because unless you're watching, the female probably will be in the ca a cave most of the day. But aggression is a big one. Don't just assume because they're chasing that this is spawning behaviour or it's um, a male. They all do, females will do it to females, males will do it to females, females will do it to males. They're drama fish. There's some social, there's quite a few social ones, but not all are social. And females are not more social than males. Um, the sp general species that are social, the females are just as social as the males. Um, there's just no difference really. There, there is so small differences, even like behaviour. You don't, you wouldn't notice the difference. Um, so the other one, sometimes you might see an assumption that males get larger, they don't. Um, males and females get to the same size, there's no real reason for males to be larger than females because the males aren't really fighting with each other for um, pairing, they're just defending a cave. The way they spawn is, if they're crevice spawners, because uh, I'm including Lorcan in here which are kind of on the surface but it's still pretty much the same. Male attracts female, male pins the female, female spawns, male guards eggs, female buggers off. Um, this is also the same if they're on the glass. Autosynchronous, they do seem to have a similar to Laurel Carno where they kind of loosely guard, unless they're holding the eggs. But they're also protecting the eggs and I've seen where males will shove off others away from the eggs if they're doing on the surface. So anyway, I'll end this video here. Hopefully it's useful. If you like my videos, please comment, like, and subscribe. And don't forget we have a Discord server that uh, we can talk about anything scientific or anything ethical or kind of along those lines, or log cards in general. And if people want to join, our, I've got the link in the description and I'll also put a link above. Anyway, thank you for watching.